This video is brought to you by Card Kingdom. And while supplies last, if you mention Saffron Olive in your order notes, we'll hook you up with a free Saffron Olive sticker with any Card Kingdom order. Hello everyone, and welcome to a super special video. As you know, Throne of Eldraine, it's fully spoiled, it is about to release, which means it is time to talk about the impact of the set on various constructed formats. We already talked standard, today it is a modern day, and for modern, I am joined again by Krim. How are you doing today, Krim? <laughs> I'm doing great still. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I'm very happy. Uh, I'm excited to see a lot of these new cards, like a, a set that has so many cards that can go into modern. I am also uh, very excited for this video. What do you think? Uh, we're going to get to our top 10 cards here in a minute, but what do you think about the overall power level of this set for modern? How good of a modern set is Throne of Eldraine? I think it's very good. It's going to, uh, like, Khans of Tarkir put a lot of stuff into modern, but, like, I mean, eventually they got banned. But the, the thing here is, I think this, like, this entire set can definitely put a lot of cards into modern. I don't know if they'll get banned. I also can see us pro like missing a lot of cards in the set that will or may make it into modern that aren't on this uh, list of 10. Yeah, it's kind of funny. A lot of times when we do a modern top 10 list, uh, the last few slots, I'm kind of like scraping around and trying to like find a justification like, oh, maybe in this certain deck in the sideboard, this will see you play. <laughs> With Throne of Eldraine, making a top 10 list was actually pretty easy and the problem was actually the other end where you probably could have like 15 cards or 20 cards even that might have a chance to show up in modern which is a sign of a pretty strong set for the format i think yeah i think that was my biggest issue keeping it at 10 <laughs> like not going above yeah. it was the hardest pro like the hardest part well speaking of 10 let's jump into our top 10 list with card number 10 which is witch's vengeance uh a new three mana sweeper only sweeping away cards of a specific creature type that you get to choose so uh what are you doing with this one in modern grim well <laughs> i'm probably going to be naming humans and and <laughs> and, and like elves and the, the thing that's important here is like that it and goblins actually is that it's minus three, minus three, which means it gets around indestructible. As you can see, some lists play things like, I, like spirits started coming back for a second and they play, you know, uh, the, the, the spirit that gives indestructible, right? Oh, selfless yeah, spirit. Selfless yeah. spirit. So it's like, cool. That's great news that you have indestructible. I'm still going to give you minus three, minus three. So I, I think this is pretty major. I'm excited to see how it plays out. It's a, it's pretty much a hard sweeper in modern. Yeah, I think this card is definitely going to be in the conversation for modern sideboard slots. You mentioned humans, you mentioned elves, you mentioned spirits. There's also, like, merfolk, there's goblins have yeah. made a kind of a comeback since Modern Horizons came out. So there's a lot of tribal decks floating around. Uh, and Witch's Vengeance is one of the best sideboard cards. Negative three, negative three, mostly enough to sweep away uh, all at least the early game threats of those tribes. And then I think it actually has some just extra flexibility. Like, if this is in your sideboard and you run into, like, a Lingering Souls deck, it's not the worst thing to use this just as a one-for-one -one to get rid of four Lingering Souls tokens, which otherwise is really annoying for some decks. If you're playing Jund and trying to, like, one-for-one -one removal people into Oblivion, a card like Lingering Souls is actually kind of obnoxious, so even outside of straight-up tribal matches, there's some other things. You're, like, Young Pyromancer going really wide with elemental tokens, which is Vengeance is a nice, like, comeback from stuff like that as well. Yeah, it, it's such a nice sweeper for decks that are also maybe like creature dependent so like let's say if i'm playing fairies i want to kill your board but i don't want to kill my own board so like playing things like cry the carnarium or, or, or maybe a damnation or something will blow up my own board so this oh that's yeah a really good point as well like if you're playing some sort of more aggressive or creaturey uh black deck it's a way it's, it's kind of like a mini plague win almost yeah so and in modern most of the times it will be so i'm a fan of this well let's move on from the world of sideboard sweepers to the world of mana bases, we have the castles. The castle cycle coming in at number nine on our list. And uh, this was actually our number one card for standard when we did the standard video. Not quite as high on these cards in modern, but I still think that these cards definitely have a chance to show up in the format, especially in decks that are kind of in the monocolor, two-color range. What do you think about these ones, Grim? Yeah, so I mean... What we said, we had talked about it in the standard video, but like this is still a land that these lands are great because they're, they're free. They're free activations. 
Um, and, and, well, the, uh, the activation cost is not free, but to throw them in the deck build, like the deck, they do not, they, they don't really hurt us in any way, right? They're not as powerful as some of the lands that we've seen in modern. It's not like we're punching with like a creature land or something like that, but some of these abilities can be really used in modern. Like if you look at the black castle, like there's, I could, I would easily throw this into death shadow. Right, like I would definitely try to make its way into Death Shadow or something like that. Yeah, the the life loss from the Black Shadow, uh, the Black Castle, good in Death Shadow. I've seen, I think it was Sam Black has been talking about uh, the Green Castle being a good option for Primeval Titan decks, allowing yeah. you potentially to ramp into Primeval Titan and something like Titan Shift on turn three instead of turn four, just by having it in your mana base. I think Castle Embereth is actually pretty exciting uh, for like maybe Goblin or 8-wax style decks where you're looking to go wide and this coming into play untapped because you're playing a bunch of mountains anyway and then just potentially pumping a bunch of goblin tokens is actually a good way to close out the game and like you said the value is just so free because the opportunity cost is so low that it doesn't take that much to uh, have these come into play untapped which makes them pretty easy a little bit more risky in modern in standard there's no blood moons there's no field of the ruins uh, but still even with a little bit more more risk to playing non-basic lands. I still think that these will show up in specific decks and uh, potentially be really good in some of those decks. Like the Primeval Titan plan with Castle Garen Rig seems pretty scary. Turn three Primeval Titan. I I don't know how you beat that. Yeah, like it's it's kind of the the green one, the black one. I think those castles have the most room to be like broken in modern, in my opinion. And then the other ones like. What do you think of, like, Kessel Vantress, Grim? Like, you're a control player. Is there any, like, you're playing blue-white control. Your mana base can support it. Is this something you stick in as a one-of just to, like, have a little extra utility in your mana base? Or even Kessel Ardenvale just to, like, make a token if the game goes long? Like, that, that's not bad. Are they in the conversation for decks like that, you think? The Scry one, maybe not. But the white one, I may, I might. Just because you had mentioned there, that I know this sounds really terrible, but there you go, a clock. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta kill your opponent somehow. At some point, your opponent has to die, right? It also makes like when you play against Jund with their lilies, if they make you sack something. Or, like, maybe they make you sack, like, a Vendillion Click or, or a Stoneforge. Well, think about, like, the blue-white modern decks that are running around right now, the mid-range ones. You get, you, you have Stoneforge, you have Spell Quellers, and, and after they remove that or make you sack it, you get to make a token if there's already a sword or something on board and equip it and still go, like, go to town. Yeah, and I mean, a 1-1, one, one, that can uh, chump block to keep your Jace or Teferi alive Correct. just as well as anything else. So Tar Tarmogoyf will get blocked. <laughs> well, let's move on. Number eight on our list. We got another white card, Deafening Silence. And uh, this is one I don't think it's going to show up in main decks, but I think it might be a pretty good one for sideboards. Each player can't cast more than one non-creature spell each turn. So, Krim, what do you think about this one? I think this is very powerful uh, out of the sideboard. I, I I don't want to know what kind of format we're in if we're mainboarding this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously this is a nightmare for, for non-creature spell casters and we were already willing to pay more mana for this effect right like we're already willing to pay uh for like like rule of law that's three mana well this one is one mana which is perfect because this gets under like cause sometimes you can just lose to like like we had mentioned neo brand before you even get to your second mana. I mean obviously sometimes neo brand just beats you before you even draw like play your first land. But like if you somehow are lucky enough to get a turn one, <laughs> well, here you go, right? They have to deal with this. Neo Brand will struggle with this. And like, I mean, like everything else, like every other uh, Storm Hate card, like Rule of Law, they will have to use like a wipe away or something. But this came at the cost of one mana, which means you can set up a little bit easier. Yeah, being one mana is really huge. Uh, Rule of Law is the easiest comparison. Uh, also, like, Ether Sworn Cannon is, shows up in some decks. But being one mana, I think the best example of this is against the Storm deck, where Storm is a deck often plays Brawl on turn two, wins on turn three. If you are uh, on the draw, when your opponent 
is able to play that brawl when on turn three, you don't actually have enough time to play a rule of law. You can get stormed off with your sideboard hate card in hand. With Deafening Silence, it's always going to come down before your opponent is able to storm off. The other sneaky aspect of this card is because it only hits non-creature spells, uh, one thing I've noticed with rule of law sometimes is if you're... uh, Yeah, if you're playing a creature deck, sometimes your rule of law is actually really annoying because you're playing against combo and you're like, okay, the way I beat this deck, I stick my sideboard hate card and then I kill my opponent before they draw out of my side uh, a way to deal with my sideboard hate card but if you had a rule of law down and you can only cast one <laughs> spell each turn it's actually harder to get that pressure going and kill your opponent so if you're playing like a vizier druid or a hate bear stack or some sort of weird like green white i don't know creature deck it's kind of like a no downside like you hit on your opponent's spell deck you don't really hurt your deck significantly at all you can still just flood the board with your creatures and kill your opponent so i think that's actually the the non-creature aspect it looks like a worse for version of rule of law because rule of law hits everything but in the right decks not hitting on creature spells is actually a big upside rather than a downside yeah it actually i the to me the non-creature like part like the, the fact that it doesn't hit creatures is almost irrelevant to me like that that's that's great cool because like the matchup i was bringing rule of law in was not for a creature deck <laughs> like i was not bringing it in for that i was bringing it for some unfair combo deck so that's why i'm on board with this and yeah hate bears you know, we've already seen like a mono white version of it and, and it's, it's playing Stoneforge, all this other stuff. Uh, but yeah, like that's cool. You don't have to cast that card. You can just put it into play. And this, I think slots right into some kind of white Thalia like deck. Well, let's move on to number seven on our list. We're actually hey. staying in the world of white cards. <laughs> we have Hushbringer. Speaking of devastating sideboard cards that could potentially just ruin someone's day, uh, shutting down enters the battlefield and also dies triggers can uh, do that. So what do you think about this one, Grim? Well, I know I've been ru- playing in the queues and I've run into a few Takali Honor Guards <laughs> randomly. Well, that whoever's, who's, whoever's out there running Takali Honor Guards, I think now you have something even better. Right? So, I think this card is absurd, uh, because Modern is a sideboard, like, kind of format, right? I told you a little bit before, it's like sideboard, like, dot format, and when you can have two things put onto one card, that's huge. Like, not only does it have Flying and Lifelink, which will add up if your opponent is on burn, they're like, well, this is annoying, they are going up a life every time, because four and three life are very different uh, costs, or different different life totals if you're against the burn opponent. And of course, uh, like, it, it blanks ETBs and it blanks dying abilities. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah, I think actually hitting on uh, dying abilities is a nice upside that uh, we didn't have on previous versions of this card. And if you look at the modern format, there's actually a lot of things this hits on. Uh, Snapcaster Mage, Stoneforge Mystic, Urza, Enter the Battlefield Trigger, Thought Not Seer, Enter the Battlefield yeah. Trigger. Uh, there are a lot of, and those are just like in the top 15-ish cards in the format. So there's actually a lot of targets as this incidentally hits on. Yeah, Titan, uh, so Titan I feel gets like blanked by it too. And, Primeval and, Titan, Season yeah. Pyromancer, Knight of Autumn, Ice Fang, Quaddle. The and, list oh goes out. Drag Tusk yeah. on the way in. On the way, the way out. out. Yeah, like exactly <laughs> on the way out. And that, that would then include like Matter Reshaper. Although that means if yeah. you kill a... If you kill a Thought Knot, I don't think you get a draw. <laughs> uh, like, a decent amount of the human stack. Like, so, so many things that this oh, hits on. So, Thalia's yeah, Lieutenant. Think, yeah. And, like, yeah. oh, my gosh. That's so good. Yeah. So, I think this is a card that if you were playing to Tekatliana Guard in your sideboard, this probably just takes its place even goes up in value if you're playing something with Collected Company, Court of Calling, and if you want to go really deep in this, I don't think it's a competitive <laughs> plan, but you could you could always use this to shut down your own negative Enter the Battlefield triggers. Maybe you want to try to, like, the Hunted Cardio's cards. Vengeance of Phage, or yes, play, like, Hunted Phantasm, or uh, whatever, Hunted Horror. Yeah. This is a way to keep you from being hurt by those cards. So, if you want to go full-on jank mode, I think that's something uh, to keep in mind as well. Well, let's move on. To number six on our list. We're moving from the world of white cards to the world of insane rituals. I still am kind of surprised that Wizards printed this card. Wizards, they've shown they don't really like rituals. They tend to stay way away from printing anything that's even don't. close to a powerful ritual. They, and then they give us Iron Craig Fee. It just, well, that's because it's not mana. a ritual. 
It's it's two and a half, like two point one rituals. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can't print one ritual, but if you put multiple of them together, well, fine. it's fine. <laughs> so so, Krim, this card four mana, add seven mana. Can you think of anything that's uh, maybe good in modern at seven mana? Nope, none, <laughs> none, none at all. None that are colorless uh, or or that require no colored mana. That is also a planeswalker named Karn Liberated. Uh, there, <laughs> like. Oh no, I can only cast one more spell this turn? Okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, uh, I kind of like this card. I'm a little worried about its power level, but uh, it's a ritual that you can't use in the traditional ritual storm off way. You can't play this in a storm deck very easily, although there is a way to get around that if you want to go dragon storm. That's a good one spell to cast for your turn that costs a lot of mana. Uh, that, so I am excited to try dragon storm with this deck, but mostly I think you just like Simeon Spirit Guide, Desperate Ritual, Iron Craig Feet, play a Karn, or play a Worm Coil, or play a six mana Chandra, or some other massive three a battle ball your battle oh sphere God. something like that i'd like turn to and then be like all right can you beat that if you can't great i win the game like i, I think that's what you do with iron craig v for the most part <laughs> is there ever a world where you do like the boros colored version and you get the uh what's the nine mana white enchantment that uh, evermore or no the one that just like pretty much counters everything for the rest of the game oh oh yeah oh i'm blanking on it at the moment that would be super sweet though because because it's like two white and and some amount of of colorless right i think it's like seven or seven generic so yeah. so as long as you have two white open you can kind of expedite your way to that card yeah that actually sounds oh, there's a lot of big expensive things <laughs> and uh it's pretty easy to cast them really quickly with this so i i'm gonna be curious uh, do you think this will end up being part of a top tier deck crim or is this something that players like me and you are going to like build wonky decks around we're going to build wonky decks and we're going to have fun but then somebody you know somebody's going to break it somebody's going to break it (laughs) and then we won't get to play with it anymore (laughs) yeah that's what i think too whenever you can see a card that can potentially put karn into play literally on turn one in magical christmas land but pretty (laughs) easily by like turn two or turn three uh, that's something you got to take notice of so i would not be the least bit surprised with how powerful this card is if someone figured out a way to abuse it yeah like the the only way that makes me feel like it's obviously not gonna be that absurdly broken is that it's triple red the cost the cost is real that is a triple red spell so like Tron, those decks, they're all playing, well, as you know, uh, like mostly colorless lands with a few things that produce colored sources. So in, in, I think realistically, I mean, Richard may love this, but maybe some kind of grawl mid range deck that, uh, <laughs> you know, like being able to go like, Inferno Titan, the ones that are playing Utopia Sprawls and Blood Moons and stuff like that. Yeah, no, that's the, or I am also kind of interested to try it in some take on like Mono Red Prison or Pyro Prison, which already has like all the rituals, already plays some big ish stuff, I guess. Right now it mostly uses four mana Karn and four mana Chandra, but yeah, you can use this to like cast your Mycosynth Lattice that you Karn out or something. I don't Ooh, know. Yeah. Like uh, I'm kind of curious about it in that shell as well, since it already seems to have a lot of the good support pieces for it. Agreed. Well, let's move on. Number five on our list, we have the Charming Prince himself, and uh, this one, another one of the like pseudo-cycle of grizzly bears with a ton of upside, enters battlefield, it just does basically anything you want. You can scry, you can gain life, you can flicker something. Also happens to be a human, a yeah. human noble, but has a relevant creature type. What are you thinking about this one, Grim? Well, I'm thinking that Watsy nailed it with the flavor, because it's a charm, and it's a Charming Prince. <laughs> Uh, and that, that is very true. And even Redu got to spoil it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and he's, and like he's the, <laughs> the charming prince of magic. So like, it was like Hall so on point at every level. Soon, yep. like by like 90, it's like a solid 96% <laughs> vote or something like, ridiculously high. I don't remember. But yeah, like this, this card, the fact that it is a human, obviously humans is already a good deck. The question is, my, my main thing about it is what does it replace? Right? Like, what are you taking out for this in the humans deck? But, Regardless, the fact that it's, once again, a bear that does multiple things, I'm a huge fan of that. And maybe maybe so, it goes into the hate bears deck. You can flicker something like a flicker wisp. Who knows? Yeah. Definitely value with the flickering in a hate bear style deck. I've seen humans players talking about it for humans. I'm excited about it for, uh, I've been playing a lot of the Soul Herder deck. Oh, that, yeah. Uh, Gabnus has one? been popularizing. Uh, the Bant one, <laughs> with yeah. With the rhinos? The Bant one. 
it's so so perfect for what that deck's trying to do. Like it works perfectly with the Soul Herder plan. The deck is already playing like lone missionaries in the sideboard a lot of times. This is basically a lone missionary with tons of upside. So worst case, I think the floor on this card is if you're playing lone missionary in some Amiria deck or some sort of uh, Soul Herder deck, it easily replaces that, and it does so much more than that. So that's where I'm looking for it. I could definitely see it sliding into the top tier decks like humans in small numbers or being a good sideboard hate card thanks to the life gain but i think it's something like soul herder blue white amiria this card is going to be absolutely insane yeah the 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 flickering is the, the obviously the best ability to scry to i don't know maybe that's like the least powerful one but who knows that that might be relevant at points yeah i think i mean i can imagine situations where you keep like two lands in this and you're like okay the scry is going to get me there like i think there are some like situations oh, yeah. where it's good but i think flickering and then life gain are the two big ones with flickering probably being number one except there will be matchups where the life gain is actually number one if you're playing against burn or something you're yeah. all about the three life but well let's move on to number four on our list we got another red card and hi another potentially broken red card fires of invention uh you can only cast two spells a turn which sounds like a drawback but you could cast spells for free as long as they're converted mana cost equal or less than the number of lands that you control so crim what could you possibly do with a card like fires of invention in modern <laughs> what have we all learned about <laughs> from free spells in modern <laughs> Like, we can't even have Jataxian Probe. We can't, like, you know what I mean? We can't, we can't have any of those. Surgical Extraction is, like, some silly price for what it does. And free spells in Modern are a big no-no. And even though you get to cast no more than two spells each turn, I don't think, that's definitely not a drawback. Because you get, what, on turn four, you have this, or, like, and then turn five, you can do, I don't know, whatever big five drop you want the two drag to drag to yeah two threat yeah okay <laughs> sure you got it two reality smashers why not and then and then like turn six i don't know drop a titan drop 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 anything drop like it it does whatever you want to do as long as you have lance obviously uh like valakut like those decks can get pretty saucy with this but i i love it I love this card. Ooh, you can you can drop a Primeval Titan to get two more lands and yeah. then cast an even bigger spell since you have more lands for your second spell. I think the other Go really Titan important thing about into like ooh. escape shift. Ooh, yeah, that that sounds pretty spicier. Yeah. Titan is a comma. That would be more fun yeah. than escape shift. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. I think I think the other thing I love about this card is there's another way that you can cast uh, Crashing Footfalls, Ancestral Visions, Restore Balance, Living End, and we've seen decks, thanks to As Foretold, kind of being built around this plan, and I've actually seen even more of them cropping up thanks to Crashing Footfalls, mm -hmm. and those decks, traditionally, you got to play... As foretold, Elector Dominant. So you're like, is it? But then you also are sometimes like up to five colors because of your free spell colors. With Fires of Invention, I'm wondering if you can just build a really consistent mono red version. Like Fires of Invention is your As Foretold. You have Elector Dominance as your backup. Maybe you could just build mono red Restore Balance or Crashing Footfalls or whatever of those that you want to do, which actually sounds like it could be pretty powerful. Worst case, more copies of As Foretold to cast your free spells is never a bad thing because if you ever played Wither against so stacks, they look really bad until they hit a way to cast their free spells immediately, and then they look insane. They just, like, uh, play their Fires of Invention, Ancestral Visions, Ancestral Visions, you're like, oh my god, they just drew six cards, like, out of the blue. So I think it's going to be really good in those decks as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you could use uh, Living End as your board wipe. <laughs> yes, or re even yeah. just Restore Balance. Yeah, that's just even, Restore Balance is the, the, board, like, the board wipe there, right? And Restore Balance doesn't hit enchantments either. It hits everything else but not enchantments for some reason, so... Oh, yeah. Know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's move on. Number two on our list, and this is a card that I expect to see Crim casting a lot in Modern. Drown in the Lock, uh, kind of just a split card of, like... I don't know, murder at two mana along with a counter spell? Like, this card seems busted to me, Krim. You're the Esper control player. What do you think about this one? Wow. <laughs> this card just is wow. I, it's a two mana. Like, it, it's easier to cast, oddly enough, because it's blue and black as opposed to double blue. Um, and then, so, choose one. Counter target spell with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of cards in its controller's graveyard. We have fetch lands. We have a bunch of cheap removal spells and fatal push, all this other stuff. Most of modern CMC sits around three or less, right? Let's just say on average about three to four or less. 
I'm yeah. pretty yep. sure we can easily get three cards in the yard just from our fetch lands alone. This obviously gets even better if you're playing a three color deck because now you have a bajillion fetch lands. And like, yeah, like, it, 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 what, what about, okay, well, counter spells suck because I just got Cavern of Souls played against me. Okay, sweet. Well, now it becomes a removal spell. And once again, it doesn't care about the power or toughness of the creature. It's just the CMC. We can actually get to a point, by the way, where there's enough cards in the late game where I don't have to exile, right? With Because, like, let's say I play Logic Knot or something like that. Uh, if it were a Logic Knot, I'd have to eat the cards in the yard, which means that my Snapcasters get a little bit worse. But now this card makes it so, like, I can just counter a Karn potentially late game. I can counter whatever I need to counter. And on top of that, it's a removal spell. Which was the issue. I just don't see many situations where I don't want this. Yeah. Like, that was, that's always been the thing, right? Like, counter spells suck here. Creature, like, creature removal sucks here. Well, this is both. Yeah, I think that is, I mean, apart from the fact that graveyards just incidentally fill in a land of fetch lands, cheap interaction spells, thought seizes, uh, it seems like this should scale through the early game almost incidentally in a lot of decks. Your opponent cracks a fetch, you thought seize them, you already have this turned on on turn two to counter anything your opponent could do or kill anything uh, anything they could do. So it doesn't seem that hard outside of like a rest in peace or something like that for this to be turned on. And then exactly as you said, uh, counter spells are great in certain matchups, but then they're dead in other matchups, which is why you can't just play a million counter spells. Then same with removal spells. Removal spells are essential to have in your deck, but then you run into Krim playing all planeswalkers <laughs> and trying to win with his white castle tokens on turn 20 and and your remo- and your re- your removal spell isn't doing very good but this card it gives you both so it's not going to be dead in essentially any matchup which is really powerful in a format like modern where there's so many playable decks people are attacking the metagame from so many different angles having a card that is good in basically every matchup is very powerful in a format like modern yeah uh, th- th- and that's the the best thing you can do in modern, especially if you're a control deck, right? You want to find stuff that is versatile. Versatility is obviously important when the meta is so crazy wide open. So, like that, that's why cards like this are absurd. And and I mean, I don't know if if this is what makes the deck good, but what if now Demir Mill can like, you know go a little bit harder now? Like what if, what what if it's even I, better? I I. Honestly, I don't think Mill, Mill sounds like a joke because it's such like a casual archetype, but then I actually lose to Mill fairly <laughs> regularly, and every <laughs> once in a while you see people putting up like 5-0 finishes with Mill, so I don't think Mill is actually that far from being a real deck in modern, and this I, card, it seems so perfect for a deck like Mill. Yeah, I mean, you play him as Miric Orb, <laughs> like, like I, I have always felt like i've said it before that mill is just like maybe a few cards away from really being a real bad like deck to play against and and this might be one of those few cards honestly this definitely feels like a step in the right direction uh because of what we talked about you don't have to choose between a removal spell and a counter spell you just get them both in a really efficient package yeah absolutely bonkers Uh, let's move on Number two on our list. We got a card that uh, I think people are a little bit concerned about. Free spells, always scary in modern. Once upon a time, potentially a free spell. If it's a first spell you cast for the turn. Worst case, it's only two mana. It's a speed to grab something out of your top five, either a creature or a land. Krim, what are we doing with once upon a time in the modern <laughs> format? Well, we had talked about Neobrand and how sometimes we just die right away. And this will... <laughs> continue that trend of <laughs> helping us die right away against them, especially if it's in their opener. It helps combo decks like that get consistency. And at the very worst, it, you're still paying two mana to grab a creature or a land card, which is not bad at all. Like paying one more mana for like an instant speed uh, like card that can help you dig and look for whatever you need in a mid-range style deck. Like you could still play this re- like fairly if you wanted. Yeah. You definitely could. I think the most obvious home for me is, like you said, uh, counter uh, combo decks that are winning with creatures. So, like, Neobrand, you got to have your Allosaurus Rider. This is just look at five cards, potentially for free if it's in your opening hand, uh, and look for your Allosaurus Rider. Also, like, Vizier Druid combo decks, you're looking to assemble two specific creatures. Uh, there's a lot of creature-based combo decks, or a decent amount in the format. Easy home there. And as Krim said, you can play it fairly as well. I've seen some people arguing that this should be in Tron, that this 
this might be I've heard some people and I don't agree with these people but I've heard some <laughs> people say it's better than Sylvan Scrying in Tron like that this is uh, because of the freeness of it allowing you to cast an extra spell before turn three to get your Karn down that it's actually uh, improves your odds of having your nut draw in Tron compared to Sylvan Scry which just grabs you a Tron piece so I expect to see this uh, card to definitely show up in the creature combo decks and maybe a lot more places as well. And as crazy as it sounds, that is kind of true, right? Like, I mean, Silver Scrying only grabs a land. This can grab, like, Ulamog, potentially. Or it doesn't tutor yeah, for it. Or a Worm Coil. Or a worm or, coil or, but yeah, yeah it, it's able to potentially nab something like that. It just misses on your Planeswalkers and, like, your little, like, whatever one mana artifact filters yeah if there's if there's one thing we know about modern uh it is no matter how bad a free spell looks and this one doesn't even look bad it's probably going to be broken uh even like really innocuous looking free spells tend to be somewhere between good and great in the format and this one actually looks like a legitimate card like yeah. casting this for two mana is not that bad it's not you're not embarrassed to cast this for two mana and it's just sometimes gonna allow you to win the game on turn one with your neobrad cabo or whatever which is pretty bonkers. Although, it, I think it was, was it you, Seth, where you talked about it? If you do get to start the game with this, it's almost like you're telling the story of how you destroyed your opponent immediately. <laughs> Once upon a time, I found, like, <laughs> Allosaurus yes. Rider, and then I... <laughs> Oh, the flavor, the flavor is good, too. It's uh, definitely going to lead to some good moments at the table. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Number one on our list. Speaking of setting up combos, we have Emery Lurker of the Lock. And this card, I think, for me, comes in number one on the list because it feels like it already has a really obvious home, which is Urza-style decks, decks with Urza. These decks have really, I think, benefited from the recent bannings. You can make an argument that they're definitely tier one and maybe one of the best decks or most popular decks in the format at the moment. And Emery seems perfect for those decks milling cards finding your artifact combo pieces and that doesn't even include just like getting back a mishra's bobble every turn to draw a card but crim i, I want to hear what you think about this one i mean i think we all agree like this like especially when we looked at both of our lists seth this card was immediately at the top right because yes this was the first card i put on and i it was number one on your list as well so yeah i think we both were in agreement on that yeah because where is it Wurza is already hard enough to, like, you can't truly hate out Wurza. Wurza can win through multiple ways. That's why it's so good, right? And, and Wurza just got a new, like, a new toy to play with, and it costs one less for each artifact you control. So you could potentially get this out as early as turn one with, you know, with the right, like, Mox Opals and, and, like, Mishra's Bobbles and, like, a Dark Steel Citadel or something like that, right? Boom. Turn one. Got it. There. Done. And then, uh, when it enters the battlefield, as you had mentioned, it fills your yard. And then at any point, you can tap and put target artifact card in your graveyard. Uh, you, you choose target artifact card in your graveyard and you may cast that card this turn. Like, so that means if anything gets blown up along the way, or like a, we can, you can get back a Mox Opal, or you can get back a Mishra's Bobble. Like th there's, there's a lot you can do with this card that just really helps the Urza deck just like get more consistency as if it wasn't already crazy consistent enough. Uh, and, and, and yeah, like it, maybe some newer combo decks start like, breaking this too some other artifact decks yeah i think there are some other like seemingly like kind of janky combos but there's definitely ways that you can uh go infinite with this by untapping it keep getting things back from your graveyard uh but i think that immediately i expect it to slot into urza and then i wouldn't be surprised if people figure out a way to uh break it on paradox engine. as well uh, paradox edge type loops uh, intruder alarm type loops getting back things uh just recasting stuff over and over and over, getting kind of like the storm kill. Uh, so I think Epri is it's going to be very good. I love that it's on curve oh. with uh, Goblin Engineer. You can potentially in Urza pretty easily with, like you said, your Mox Opals and stuff, get this down on turn one. Even just like Island 2 free artifacts, like your Mishra's Bobble type effects. You can play this on turn one. Turn two, you play your Goblin Engineer. Uh, you can start casting the stuff that you tutored with your Engineer to start looping stuff from your graveyard. It adds another really resilient engine to the Urza decks and possibly other artifacts fact decks as well so uh, i think this card gonna be pretty bonkers in modern ether flux reservoir we found it Ooh. we found Ooh. it <laughs> Par yes i think that does it like reservoir <laughs> like two two mox opals and uh in this to just like keep casting and looping them and upping your uh your storm count with like a paradox engine. Yeah. got him got him got him <laughs> 
<laughs> we broke it. I expect a video on that next week, Grim. Get Format's broken. You're welcome to the new modern. You're welcome. Solved. Solved. <laughs> anyway, I think that that brings us to the end of our top 10 modern cards from Throne of Eldraine. So, Grim, thanks for hanging it out. It's always fun to do these videos. And thanks to everyone for watching. So uh, let us know what you think about Modern and Throne of Eldorain. Which of these cards are you most excited to play? What do we forget? Is there anything else that deserves mention as being super playable in Modern? What decks are you building? What cards are you playing? What decks are you putting them in? Let us know in the comments. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed it, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video! If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.